This webinar looks at making resilient buildings and neighbourhoods seen through the experience of Scotland's Housing Expo. We will look at the importance of design as an essential component to settlement making and we'll also look at some key examples and hear from architects, urban designers and the client themselves about how such a project can be delivered. Scotland's Housing Expo was held in Inverness. There's a number of reasons for this. It's a fast growing capital and one in the throes of growing pains with a real need for some good design. The site is on Balvoni Brays to the south of the city, overlooking the hills down to the Cromarty Firth. The competition was organised by the RIAS and was held in 2007. The expo is based on a Finnish model and was championed and organised by the Highland Housing Alliance, which is a unique development company dedicated to building a wide variety of homes in the Highlands. The work includes self-build, new energy homes and architect design properties. The construction process and the commissioning process for the expo was a long and tortuous experience, buffeted by the recession but at the end, the expo was realised in August 2010. A total of 55 houses spread evenly between affordable housing and private sector purchase were constructed. The expo was important, not only for the houses, but for its educational dimension. A number of organisations were represented and provided an interactive experience for visitors. This included New Start Highland, the Edinburgh International Science Festival, Architecture and Design Scotland, SUST and the Spaces of Labour project. I'm here with Susan Torrance of the Highland Housing Alliance. Susan, can you tell us something about the origins of the Expo? Sure, John. Um, about 2005, which is actually the date our own organisation was set up, a delegation of people from Highland Council, Scottish Government, Homes for Scotland, Forestry Commission went over to Finland uh, to visit the housing fairs uh, that have taken place there over the last 40 years. The Finns have developed a very successful model over that, that time period and what happens is that towns and uh, cities bid to hold the annual housing fair. And what they'll normally do is volunteer a site, sometimes they're rural sites, sometimes they're urban sites. Uh, they're master planned uh, by an architect so that uh, there's a layout. And then there's an architectural competition held. Uh, and what happens is the architects pair up with developers, they bid to build um, you know, their winning designs uh, within the fair and the ones that, that win obviously go on to be built and then the houses are exhibited to the public. Um, the whole process, I have to say, from the moment that a town bids uh, to hold a housing fair to the actual opening to the public takes on average about six years in Finland. So in 2005, uh, we, we, we rather, what is it, uh, I, won't, I won't use the word foolishly, but optimistically thought that we were actually going to do it in, uh, in two years and, and uh, you know, have, our, have our original fair in, in 2007. And it was called the Highland Housing Fair at that point. However, our biggest challenge was actually finding a site. Um, having made the decision that Highland Council would sponsor and run uh, a housing fair, we then ran into the problem that the council had actually been very efficient over, over the years in disposing of publicly owned sites for affordable housing. So there wasn't a ready-made uh, public sector site that could be used, and we then had to really go into the private sector and actually buy land uh, as the site that we would, we would choose for the, for the housing fair. And when the Expo focus moved from a Finnish context to a Scottish context, yep. what were the main issues that you wanted the Expo to address? That's a really interesting question because the advisory group had the Forestry Commission, Homes for Scotland, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, the Council, and all of these organisations had, had a different agenda. Uh, there was also people called Highland Birchwoods who were obviously very interested in promoting Scottish timber, Scottish biofuels. So each one of these agencies were, were terribly excited about the fair, uh, but were also bring, bringing, as I say, their, their own set of objectives. Um, and you know, we wanted to demonstrate good design, we wanted to work with, with architects, and we wanted to show that 
housing you know, could break out of the mould. Um, because you remember about that time, 2005, 6, 7, uh, it was the time of uh, really houses being built. I won't use willy-nilly, that's maybe not the right word, but there was certainly massive private, private building going on in Inverness and, and the rest of Scotland. And there was an accusation that, that towns uh, and cities were becoming any town, anywhere, because of the similarity of design um, and because people really you know, couldn't identify, if you like, with some, um, some local, uh, local perspective. So um, part of the, the, the fair's aspirations uh, were to do something unique and, and special in the Highlands to showcase design and also give uh, developers and builders a chance to experiment with new materials, new build systems, uh, different ways of doing things. Um, because again, because, uh, because of the adage is that if it ain't uh, broke, don't fix it, um, there's a huge reluctance from the private sector particularly to experiment and to embrace uh, new forms of construction going forward. So the, the fear was designed to kickstart some of that thinking. This webinar deals not only with technological sustainable strategies, but also how good neighbourhood design can make socially sustainable settlements through careful urban design. In the Expo, the streets and housing layout are inspired by the sociable qualities of settlements in the Highlands, such as crofting communities geared towards more healthy and sustainable lifestyles and a safer shared residential environment. At the beginning of the Expo process, the Highland Housing Alliance appointed Cadell to urban designers, both to formulate a briefing and framework document and then to undertake the detailed urban design. We spoke to Johnny Cadell about his engagement with the project. We looked at a whole series of um, towns across the Highlands to look at how they fitted into the landscape, from, ranging from St Kilda to uh, Castletown, Plockton, Ullapool, um, and drew something from all of these places. Um, we also looked very closely at the landscape round about the, round about the site for, for the expo. And I might just explain um, a, li a little bit about what we were thinking of there. Um, I mean, this, this, this is a, a, a series here of uh, drawings um, and, and, a, and then a sketch of the master plan um, as, as it was shaped up at the competition stage. And it, and it sets out, um, for example, the, lo looking at where the existing uh, patterns of tree belts, forest, woodland um, and water channels are passing across the site. One of the interesting aspects of the site is it's, it's 18th century um, parkland, which is essentially recovered from moorland um, for, for agriculture. So as going from the, from the upper part of the site, which is moorland, to the bottom of the site where there's forest, uh, there's, a, there's this man-made and structured landscape. This diagram looks at the way that routes pass up and down the site the way that uh, footpaths pass across contours, the way that roads tend to go straight up and down the slopes, some st quite steep slopes in places. This is um, putting it together and starting to think about where principal building lines would go, uh, reinforcing this, this sense of passing up and down or across the contours, uh, working with the patterns of waterways and and Making, making bridges, causeways to cross over water, uh, in bringing new water channels into the site, um, and then organising the architecture and the building lines around about that. And this, if you like, is an abstract um, of that, which is just showing the, the, wa the waterways in connection with the building lines and how, how, that, how that works out. So what we arrive at at the end of that process is... Um, a series of uh, water channels. There's one here. There's one that goes up and down the site. Uh, the, 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 the surface water ends up in new pools and um, ponds at the lower part of the site. The, the principal street is an avenue and it's an extension of existing patterns of trees. The green here is at a, at a particular part of the site 
which becomes a meeting place for uh, two routes. But it's also a point where you, get a, where you get a view out into the wider landscape. So the sorts of ideas that are encapsulated in the early master plan are to do with that response to the very particular site, to the very particular place, and making a framework for the architecture. I think it's interesting because in some ways, often master plans which look at sustainable issues talk very much in the abstract about things such as uh, water remediation or orientation. But I think the interesting thing about the way in which you're approaching the master plan is that the history of the site, the existing waterways, the topography, um, the cultural landscape, for want of another word, is integrated into that. And I think because of that, it gives a much more authentic response. Well, I think that's, that, that we, we were certainly concerned with all of that. I think we, we were concerned partly because of the, the model that the expo represented of a whole lot of individual houses designed by separate architects. That there was a potential for that to be, to be a relatively narrow agenda. And I think, you know, speaking as, a, as, a, as an architect as well as, as an urban designer, um, I, I'm, I'm conscious that you know, we as architects, when given an individual house to design, can think of that in, in isolation, can tend to think of that as, as, a, as an individual project. But the, these needed to join up. The houses in the, in the expo site needed to join up to make a community which people were going to move into, and that needed to be diverse enough, broad enough, have the quality of life that went with the, with the community. And it wasn't just about a whole lot of individual separate houses. So when we talk about community, because this is very, very important in the way in which we do go about making resilient settlements, how exactly did you go about that? The, that, that came about from both looking at the mix and there's a, the, the, there's a whole variety of different. Um, the, 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 there's a whole the whole series of um, affordable houses uh, of different sizes and different scales. There are a series of different types of, of large family houses, smaller houses, apartments. Um, so this is attracting a very broad community to live in in in, in the uh, at the expo site. So there's, there's, there's that aspect of, of getting, the, getting the mix right and, and actually building in opportunities for home working, um, for, for making people to, to uh, make their own produce. Uh, the, 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 the rural location gave opportunities for different types of ways of working with the site. Um, so to try and bring out a diversity of lifestyle in the, in the actual... So this is really part of the, the briefing element uh, for, for, for the architecture. Um, but then, in terms of creating a, uh, an environment which would support a community, that's much more about the, creating the right sorts of streets. So that, for, ex for example, the, the, the streets are designed uh, not as prim primarily as traffic routes for cars, but are designed primarily as as walking routes and easy walking routes so that they follow the contours uh, so that one place is very easily accessible to the next that you don't have to walk around a long and winding route we'd been affected by the um, the housing next door there's there's a Mil milton of leeds has been built very fast and on a very large scale um, and it's a it's perhaps a fairly um, familiar model of um, volume house building, of being, uh, prioritising the civil engineering of putting in roads and then having a series of individual houses um, attached to that, but where it's very difficult to find your way around. Long, sinuous streets and uh, you, you, can't, you don't know how to walk from one place to the next. You tend to just jump in your car. And it, it encourages a lifestyle which is more... Um, uh, where, where each every, every family living in, in each house comes and goes, um, they don't necessarily have much occasion to uh, 
meet up with their neighbours or to, or to even walk around about the place in which they live, they're coming and going, uh, whether they're going to, to, the, to the town centre for shopping or whether they're going to work, um, whether they're going out in the evening. They're, they're, they're not actually um, necessarily participating in any, anything, in any connected lifestyle with the people that live around them. So there's an opportunity to look at how to bring a community together and to facilitate that community being able to do things like hold a barbecue, simple things. Um, the, 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 the way that the, the, the play area for the children is located is actually feels like a pleasant place that people would actually want to go to and use. And that that's integrated with the way it's designed. That there are opportunities like um, the way the car parking works on the site, that rather than all the car parking being in board of the house site, uh, that some of, some of it's shared and it's on street. So you might be, even though it's not, not a, an urban site, it's still possible to park your car under the trees and you might bump into somebody um, as, as, you're, as you're walking home in the evening. And there's, a, there's actually these opportunities there which are, which are built in. When we're looking at a wider context, which is through the master planning process, what we can learn from the Expo and apply to future projects in Scotland, what do you think are some of the key things we can learn? Well, I think it, I think it demonstrates that the streets and places can be made by individual architecture um, and, and that if, if you uh, have a, cer a set of quite, quite simple uh, common factors, which is about um, material, similarities of material, and there's a lot of use of uh, t timber, and so there's a lot of similarities between the, the palette of materials used by different architects on the site. There are um, common factors like working to certain frontage lines of buildings, which give it a, a, a linked identity. Um, but I think one of the things for me that's interesting about it is that we, there, there are these collective factors which, which help it to hang together, but there's a lot of individuality there as well. And, and one, of the, one of the remarkable things about a competition site is that you get a whole lot of different architects coming up with some very interesting um, alternative ways of going round corners, framing views, um, different ways of making a front, uh, the, the public space towards the front of, of your house and different ways of creating privacy or, or openness or proximity to neighbours. So each, each of the, it becomes a, a demonstration, a very, a very diverse way of, of handling um, these these issues about interrelationships between buildings and the public realm, and so it's got it's got a bit of both, and I think it's I think that having a bit of the collective and a bit a bit of the individual is a, is a really really strong aspect of it, and it's something to be harder to imagine outside of a competition site and an expo site. So I, th I think that's probably its greatest mm -hmm. strength. Well. I've got a couple of examples um, in, these, uh, in these photographs here, which is probably the best way to explain. Um, and I mean, this, th th this, this one is showing a view in a, as, as built of the, of the expo, looking up the surface water swale. So this, this is one of those water channels and how it actually affects the, how it's affected the architecture. So what's essentially happened is that uh, that becomes a, a foreground for all for all the houses that are along along the edge of this edge of the site, um, of of a water channel which is uh, bridged over using recycled rail sleepers and uh, river washed uh, rocks. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a sense of a very strong band of the natural landscape, which is uh, which is coming right into the site. And every single house that sits on that particular street has to um, has to cross over 
the, 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 the swale to be able to, get, to, to be able to get in. So it has a fundamental effect on the architecture. Um, similarly, in this, uh, in this photograph here, this is showing the village green, uh, and there are, three, there are three houses at the village green that uh, look, look over it, and they're, they're, they're really quite an interesting example of different ways of a, a, a private house having a very, very public situation onto the central uh, space, and different ways in, in which architects have responded to that making recessed frontages, big glass walls in some places, to be very expansive, uh, very, very public, very social response. Um, in, this, in this case, slightly less so, there's still a sheltered outdoor space, a place you can imagine a, a couple of people uh, sheltering from, from the rain but still being outdoors. So this feels very public, this house. And then this the third one over here, s suddenly much smaller windows, uh, much narrower openings, not the same sense of a connection with the street. So there's, there's almost um, a range there of different ways in which the architects have, have responded to the, to the street in this public space. So that's, that's, that's the effect on the architecture here. And then in terms of the public realm, the, 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 there's an open green, um, there are places for people to sit, there, there are steps, there's something of an amphitheatre, it's encouraging people to use that outdoor space, whether it's to, to hold a party, could be to hold a, hold a wedding, um, or it could just be sitting out there and having a picnic. And one of the great things about a structure like this turf wall here is that it's, it's great for people to sit on, but it's also something that automatically just encourages kids to play. So this is making streets in the public realm that people will actually want to get out and use. So it's not just there as a bit of a greenwash. It's actually very central to the way that the architecture works and, and the whole site works. The Expo showcases a large number of innovative housing types that pull together contemporary design with good practice, low carbon technologies. Originally, the aims for the Expo at competition level was much higher. The site was split into four quadrants. One zone would major on wood fuel technology, another on solar design, a north zone on carbon neutrality, and the east zone concentrating mostly on recycling. These were linked to design strategies for each of the quadrants of the Expo site to ensure that even in such a small development, there were specific urban design characteristics in each quadrant. Although some of the original aims of the Expo were not quite realised, all the competition buildings and those houses constructed had to adhere to quite tight performance standards. There was an aspiration towards a Briam excellence standard. Fabric heat loss was to be 20% below the current standard. There was to be a 50% improvement on the target emissions rate for the standard assessment procedure for each building. And it was hoped that each house would have an air permeability of 2 cubic metres per hour per square metre when tested at 50 pascal. We're now going to show a couple of examples of houses with very, very good levels of engagement with environmental sustainability criteria. The first building we shall look quickly at is the Passive House by HLM Architects. This building is one of very few buildings in Scotland certified to Passive House standards. It has an 80% energy reduction on current regulations, combined with very, very high levels of insulation with a prefabricated timber panel system. It has very, very low levels of air leakage combined with mechanical ventilation in the heat recovery. Another house showcasing innovative timber products at the Expo is the Timber House by John Gilbert Architects. The key feature of this house is solid timber construction of five layer cross laminated walls with very, very low embodied energy for the main structure. This form of construction is also hygroscopic and also has high thermal mass, which is often very difficult to achieve with standard timber frame. 
The construction is prefabricated and also features very high levels of insulation. We can therefore see that many of the Expo buildings display best practice for Scotland with innovative low carbon and sustainable technologies. Economic and social dimensions of sustainable development are important too. Construction in rural areas often involves investment that if spent locally can critically improve economic resilience and therefore social cohesion. Practices such as rural design based in Sky recognise the importance of this and consider carefully in their specification decisions where construction investment can be directed. Rural Design's Secret Garden House is distinctive in the Expo for a number of reasons. It showcases building skills and suppliers from the architect's base in Sky. I asked Alan Dixon of Rural Design about the genesis of the project. I think we were very excited with the project, the Highland Housing Fair as it was called then. To us talked about local issues in the Highlands of relevance. You could argue that the Highlands has some very poor quality new build housing. So there's an opportunity to communicate that things could be an awful lot better. And uh, what we were trying to do through that was really show that there's an alternative to the kit house. Um, so so the, while the site is suburban, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not without connection to the landscape, which is in the distance, or views to the distance, but also we use the garden as an opportunity to communicate some of the ideas of sustainable living that you might have in a croft in the Highlands. Can you tell me something about that? Because that's quite a specific part of the design. Yes. Um, while a croft is a bigger area, and you might have sheep and chickens and all these things, this is more of that in the microcosm and the idea that you can grow your own vegetables. Ideally, it will be polytunnel in here. I suppose you could have chickens. Uh, but you'd harvest your vegetables into the undercroft space, and there's a special space there for cleaning vegetables and washing them, and then they come directly into the kitchen, where obviously they'd be cooked, and then next door to that's the dining space where you would eat your, your vegetables, and then obviously the living space. So uh, I think through that connection to the landscape, the house in a way has turned inside out. So uh, the back garden is really the front garden, and all the living spaces focus on these spaces. So even though we're in almost a kind of suburb of Inverness, I mean, the design of this house very much has a rural sensibility yes. to it. Yes. I th I, it could almost be a standalone house, and I think it could work in that context, although it was designed in a site-specific way. For example, picking up in the gradual slope in the site introduces uh, varying levels in the house, which, which adds to the interest. But uh, So, in one sense, it's site-specific, but I think the ideas yeah. could be communicated further afield. Because here we are in this kind of dining room, coming into the living room, and then you have this really the heart of the home yeah. being the fireplace and the hearth. I mean, does this say anything about your approach to low energy design and technology and sustainability? Yes. Um, we, we tend to avoid gadgets. Um, some, some of these could be fads. We don't know if the technology is tried and tested. So keeping things simple in terms of lots of insulation, um, Using wood fuel, for example, is uh, uh, both very cost effective and a very good use of the resources that surrounds us. Um, and, and, and avoiding complexity in one sense. We've looked at air source heat pumps in the Highlands and they might save you some money in terms of your bills, but then you've got to pay somebody £500 a day to come and service it once a year and they're coming from Glasgow or uh, Edinburgh or something like that. So it's not always, technology is not always the answer. So robustness so, is very yes. important. Yes. Uh, and good construction, uh, air tightness is important. Uh, and, uh, you know, really a aiming for good quality with traditional limited resources. Because even though it feels a very, very spacious building, it's actually quite tightly planned, yes. this house, and yeah. quite compact. The floor area here is 122 square metres, and it could be a three and a half bedroom house. Um, and I think it's one of the smallest houses in the, in, in, in the housing fair development. And again, I think the, the smaller a house is, the greater amount of energy, or the le lesser amount of energy it uses, the greater amount it saves. So um, I, think, I think it's a very important thing uh, that, that space is important, both in terms of energy, but also in affordability of a building. Yeah. 
Because, I mean, if you have spent money, you could make an argument to say that it's been spent on things such as daylight. Yes, indeed. In, in, in volume and uh -huh. in making the building a pleasure and, and, to be and, and good quality materials, for example, the zinc roof uh, isn't something that's the, certainly the cheapest, but it will have an extremely long life expectancy, certainly in excess of 100 years. So, again, it's a good use of uh, it's kind of tight resources. Yeah. In a world where building procurement is becoming ever more centralised and we're seeing less and less but of larger and larger companies building and supplying building materials, where does your building stand in this? I think um, it uses traditional skills. Um, the, the, the kit, the timber frame was built on site, it wasn't imported uh, and you know, it was basically a pallet of timber arrived off the back of a lorry and skilled tradesmen put it together. I think there will always be a place for that. Um, you know, Prefabrication is important, but if the materials are having to come thousands of miles, it really doesn't make that much sense to me. So I think local prefabrication may be some kind of uh, answer to that. But in this instance, this was handmade, as it were. And I think uh, we're used to, in Sky, having some... Uh, very skillful all trades joiners. Um, they might not be the most talented in terms of finishing, but they're very talented in, in, in putting buildings together in timber frame technology and things like that. And that's a great resource to have. And because we used a sky builder for this house, we were able to take advantage of all these skills. This house is called the Whole Life House at Scotland's Housing Expo. It was designed by our practice, Brennan and Wilson Architects. The whole life house looks at two key dimensions of sustainable development. The first being that of environmental sustainability through low carbon technologies, and then looking at how flexibility and adaptability can ensure that the whole life house can contribute to more resilient communities. The environmental response of the whole life house is relatively straightforward and follows current good practice. It is by nature a passive solar house, so the vast majority of the glazing is to the south. It also has high mass floors to ensure that there is a degree of thermal inertia in the structure, as well as a standalone sun space. It also has a number of renewable technologies, such as active hot water, and as well as that, has high levels of insulation throughout the building envelope. One of the main drivers behind the design of the whole life house is questioning the suitability of a lot of private sector housing to actually meet the needs of the new and complex ways in which we see households developing in Scotland. If we look at the Scottish Government's Social Research Housing Aspiration Survey, 4% of people have to move to adapted accommodation, 16% of people have to move because of changes in family size, and a further 23% of people want to move because the size and configuration of the house does not suit them. In other words, nearly half of the sample moved or consider moving house because their current dwelling does not cater for their needs and aspirations. If we look at what actually constitutes households in Scotland, if we look at the mythical large family or large household, we see that it only accounts for 7% of the total number of households in Scotland whilst much smaller households, such as single pensioners, single adults and small adults, account for a much larger proportion of the number of households that we have. This is a relatively new field, and there are emerging practices in terms of making adaptable housing. There is the Adaptable Futures Research Project, which started in 2010, although this is mostly towards non-domestic buildings. However, in Milton Keynes, there was a super flexible housing study. There's also the Buildings for Life initiative running from 2005, and of course, the Designing Lifetime Home Scheme from 2007. Why should we be building more flexibly? First of all, for greater home working opportunities. In Scotland, 25% of the working population in rural areas are home-based. 
Also, less reason to move builds more stable communities, and buildings that are adaptable and flexible require less resource consumption over the lifetime. We're also seeing, especially in rural areas, a new demographic called the established young. And all this together is making for more complex households and the need for buildings to be more adaptable and more flexible. One of the key elements of the whole life house is the idea of splitting it into two parts, a core living area and also a flexible annex. Here we are outside the whole life house in the south facing garden. Here I think it shows quite clearly the way in which the building is designed. On this side we have the main part of the building which has all the fixed accommodation, the kitchen, the dining, the living room with the bedrooms upstairs. But a key difference is that on this side here we have the annex and the annex has been deliberately designed to be as flexible and as adaptable as possible. It has a separate access from the front lobby which means the main part of the house isn't disturbed and within this part of the building you can have it in a whole different series of configurations from granny flat to home office to family room to something which can even be rented out separately. This is a plan view of the building. Internally you can see the main block with living room with a flexible annex as a separate wing. A key feature of the design is a shared entrance that gives direct access to each part of the building, allowing the annex, for instance, to be used as a workplace that could accommodate visitors and co-workers without disrupting the life of the house. The main block includes the core functions of the house, bedroom upstairs, kitchen and living downstairs. This part of the house is quite distinctive in its design, with the living and kitchen areas having quite specific characters. On the other hand, the annex is designed to be easily modified with drainage stacks and water supplies easily accessed and none of the internal partitioning being load-bearing. We can now look at some of the different ways in which the annex can be configured. These are only a few examples of hopefully are many ways in which this flexible part of the building can be converted over its lifetime. Some of the possible uses for the annex include an extra bedroom for a small household for a growing family with an additional family room. Those with larger or growing families could use the annex to provide two extra bedrooms. Many households are seeing young adult members staying in the family residence because of housing stock supply issues and the costs of getting on the housing ladder. This option sees the annex being used as a bed sitter with an open plan bedroom come living room. With ageing populations, household types are becoming more complex. This option shows an older household member having their own bedsit with kitchen and living facilities as well as a bathroom. There are many lessons to be learned from the Expo. There is a challenge in funding innovation on a full for profit model in the way in which the Finnish precursor did not have to worry about. However, more importantly is the way in which often disparate sustainable technologies are integrated into housing design and in this aspect the Expo worked very well. Then there is the way that events such as the Expo try to show things holistically where we can learn how to make resilient and adaptable communities that are sustainable in the long term. We'll leave the last word to Susan Torrance of the Highland Housing Alliance. Susan, looking back at the Expo, how do you think it's changed the way in which we look at sustainable design? That's a really interesting question, John. I think the first thing is we've actually had a debate about what sustainable housing actually is. I think it's very easy to throw this word, uh, which is seen as kind of the holy grail of what we're all trying to achieve, into whether it's planning literature or whether it's uh, you know books about architecture or whatever. But I think what, what interested me was everybody's different views as to what that actually actually meant. 
The other really interesting thing is that a lot of the competition entries uh, we found were coated in, in what people thought were sustainable things, uh, i.e. lots of renewables, lots of micro, micro technology, when in fact um, the, the best designs actually looked at the thermal properties of the buildings that were being built and really any heating uh, issues or, or, or uh, what is it, um, fuel issues um, were kind of added on, on, on afterwards. And as I say, the most successful designs were the ones that really abandoned the eco-bling, for want of a better word, and looked at the, the integrity of the building and the integrity of, of the design. So I'm really pleased there's been a debate about, about sustainability. Um, I think we also had some interesting debates around the types of materials that were used, for instance. And I talked about the Forestry Commission and Birch, Highland Birch, who has been very keen on um, use, the use of Scottish timber. But the reality was, in, in, uh, when architects were specifying components, there wasn't actually a Scottish equivalent that, that we could find, or they were insisting on, on specification from outside of, outside of Scotland. So we'd no choice but, but to go elsewhere. And when you, you look at the whole issues of transport and carbon use uh, in, in, in terms of actually getting uh, materials onto site, um, I think, as I say, there, there were some things there where there were contradictions between the aspirations and the use of the word sustainability and what we actually did in, in the long run. So, Susan, if that's the case, what skills do design and building professionals need to have to mainstream this kind of expo thinking? I think both the profession and the building industry really ha need to have a much deeper understanding of where, where they're both coming from. We saw lots of examples of architects with, with, with great design ideas, but trying to translate them then, you know, taking their concept car into, into the, the, the built building was sometimes difficult. Uh, and that's where collaborating with the, with the building industry, understanding some of the very practical solutions that they were able to come up with really assisted. Um, I think there's issues too in terms of understanding cost, value, um, the, the whole idea that uh, a product being created has then got to be, got be, got to be sold into a market that, that, that's there for it, if you see what I mean, again is something that the building industry and, and the professionals need to, need to grasp hold of. And then there's some other interesting things as well to do with supply chains and um, you know, I talked about you know, specifying and procuring materials um, and there often were local alternatives quite honestly but it was just people didn't know about them um, and after the, the, the expo we actually had uh, suppliers phoning up and saying gosh if I'd known I, I would have got my product in there. Um, so it seems to me that we all need to be a lot more aware of what we're trying, trying to do in terms of sustainability, what we're trying to do in terms of learning, learning and working with each other that you know, architects can't sit on the one hand and say, well, these are our designs and that's all there is to it, which I know, I know they don't do in the main, but all I'm trying to say is that um, you know, collaborating with the building industry, they're stronger going forward and there's much more potential for, for the, you know, the great aspects of design, the great aspects of, of opening up people's uh, minds to using new materials and different way of doing things, we can move forward together with, most importantly, a product that the, that the market wants um, and that people will want to buy or will want to live in as, as, as an affordable home.